Hey, this is Linda Cohn from ESPN, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. And the ML Sports Platter back with you all over the major platforms. Make sure you download, subscribe, and leave those five-star reviews. Really appreciate the feedback, and you can get me on Twitter as well, at Mike L Sports. We are presented by our great friends at Stanley Law Offices, Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse, and Welch and Company Jewelers. Log on today for the best jewelry around, from watches to necklaces to engagement rings and more. Daniel Luce and the gang do an amazing job at Welch and Company Jewelers. Visit the showcase today at welchjewelers.com. Tip of the cap thanks to Ken's Auto Detailing, Axe Exotic Pets, and the Syracuse Fitness Store as well for supporting the ML Sports Platter. So I got a, a little bit going on in this episode. I got two, it's a two-part type thing. Uh, I'm going to evaluate the games uh, as you listen to this, this weekend in college football. It's going to be, you know, this is one of the great weekends kicked off that I can remember uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the games are epic. Two, uh, there's so much on the line, obviously, right away. And three, you know, the fans. I mean, we, we're going to have fans back, um, you know. Despite what you might hear from, you know, the make-believe media and, you know, the left side and all these people, you know, the, the mainstream garbage uh, about Corona still, uh, we have turned a corner. Uh, I don't know why we're going backwards in some instances with kids wearing masks all the time and, and, and certain things and places changing rules every day. But um, And look, I'm not trying to be insensitive to those who have gotten it, those who have died. Um I think it's something. I don't think it's everything. We've dealt with the flu for 120 years. We can't deal with Corona, but we have fans back. And I think it's important. I think it's going to be great. The atmospheres are here again. Um, And and the way we used to watch and consume college football is, is back. When I get done breaking down the big, big games, and I will touch on Syracuse against Ohio as well, uh, a little crossover episode for you from Bill's Brawl. Uh, recap the preseason, previewing the season, uh, talking uh, 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 about the offense and if it can get better, um, all sorts of good stuff with Nick Firo. He's a terrific Buffalo Bills analyst for Sports Illustrated. So you'll hear that interview here in a few minutes. So let's break some of these games down, obviously. Um, first of all, I'm just going to preview it now. I've got Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and, uh, and, and Georgia going to the college football playoff. Uh, Ohio State plays, um, well, they played uh, last night, so, um, but I think they're going to, I think they're just going to have a huge year. Uh, North Carolina against Virginia Tech, I mean, Heisman candidate in this game and Sam Howell, uh, I expect North Carolina to roll. Uh, same deal with Oklahoma and uh, and the Tulane game, I just don't see it um, for Tulane. Uh, Oklahoma also has, you know, Another Heisman candidate, right? One of the best quarterbacks in all of college football in terms of Spencer Rattler. Uh, you know, and we know Lincoln Riley's system, it's unbelievable. It produces Heisman after Heisman. Remember, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray. Now will Spencer Rattler be, I think it'll be three Heisman winners if he wins it in five years. Oklahoma's pedigree is there. And Oklahoma's knocking on the door. They really need to get into the college football playoff. Uh, interested to see what the new look Alabama offense looks like in terms of what you know, skill set and all the rest, but uh, it's going to be interesting. Bryce Young now at quarterback with his, what, $1 million in NIL money. Um, But expect guys to just slide in and be the Alabama Crimson Tide dominating players. I mean, they've got guys who are just ready, uh, ready to roll. Um, You know, I think there's literally a couple of stars, you know, in the making uh, on this, on this team. Um, without a doubt, uh, I think A.G. Hall is one of them, the freshman wide receiver. He's so talented. I've read so much about him. I think it's A.G. Hall is how you pronounce it. Uh, but he wears number 17. He, I think, is going to be just an absolute stud, follow in line with, you know, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, right? Like, uh, Devontae Smith, you know, uh, uh, Waddle, right? Like, all the, all the, all the Bama wide receivers, um, I don't even know if you can call it running back you or quarterback you or receiver you or defense you or Saban you. I don't even know what you call it because you just produce everywhere. Um, you know, the running back room is awfully, awfully strong. Um, you know, great recruiting class as always. They've got some budding defensive stars who are ready to just take the reins as well. 
Uh, a nice mix of some underclassmen and upperclassmen on this team and just pros all over the place. So uh, I just don't see Miami um, keeping up with Alabama. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, this is a huge, huge test for Miami. And really, as a top 15 team facing arguably the best team in college football, this could be one heck of a statement early to you know solidify themselves and put them in position for some serious, serious, uh, you know, Playoff consideration even. Um, this game, though, no home field advantage for the Canes. It's at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, so there'll be more Alabama fans there probably than Miami. High-octane Oregon, home for Fresno State. Expect Oregon big in that game. Wisconsin, Camp Randall, man, that place will be rocking for Penn State coming in. A Big Ten showdown, top 20 teams. Should be fun stuff there. Uh, really, really looking forward to, obviously, a couple other games. How about LSU? And UCLA, UCLA great against Hawaii, uh, and, and and now you know Chip Kelly kind of trying to save his gig this year. Uh, Washington, number twenty in the country, should roll Montana. Texas A and M, a lot of people have Jimbo Fisher and crew uh, in the college football playoff. I could see it, I could as the fourth team, um, but they've got uh, uh, they're just going to pancake Kent State. Florida will destroy Florida Atlantic. USC uh, should destroy San Jose State. Um, San Jose State, though, man, they got some pretty good kids, pretty good players, and they got Starkle at quarterback. Uh, uh, you know, Nevins carrying the football. Charles Ross, a talented player, can catch it. So uh, that's a good team. Texas home for Louisiana and the Raging Cajuns. Um, tell you what, man, when is Texas going to figure it out? Right? They're they're kind of like the Cowboys of college football. Uh, Cincinnati, big time offense at Nippert Stadium against Miami of Ohio. They should roll and watch Cincinnati. <clears throat> they're a team. I'm telling you right now, Cincinnati um, can 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 get through the year with only one loss against Indiana or Notre Dame because those are big big games they schedule. They schedule them for a reason. That if you run the table and beat those two, you might end up in the college football playoff. Right? They're going to bomb Miami of Ohio. They're going to kill Murray State, Temple, UCF, Navy, Tulane, Tulsa, South Florida. You know. The American Athletic, I mean, it's, it's weak. Tulsa, SMU, East Carolina, South Florida. Solid team, solid conference, but nowhere near the big boys. And they scheduled, to their credit, rising Indiana and Notre Dame's Notre Dame. And so if Indiana can maybe go 10-1 and one and go 1-1 one and one against those teams, they might have a shot. You know, I, I don't think they'd get in over a one-loss SEC team, uh, but I think that it would be fascinating to see if they could kind of backdoor their way in. Uh, and then, five, well, there's two other games to get to. Indiana, Iowa uh, should be a fun one, 17 versus 18 there at Kinnick Stadium. And then the final one that I wanted to talk about is just this Georgia Clemson game, which is just loaded with everything. And it's in Charlotte. I know a lot of people in Charlotte. Some buddies I have. If you're going to the game, I'm so jealous. I, I, if there's anywhere I'd like to be this weekend, it would be there to watch this game because the storylines are just crazy, right? Like, this is a game where I think both teams have a legitimate shot, legitimate shot, obviously, at the college football playoff. Uh, and, and the team that loses, I don't think the season's over by any stretch of the imagination. Both can certainly come back. You've got the quarterback storyline with JT Daniels uh, at Georgia. Um, you know, everybody knows, you know, kind of what his story is. Um you know, leading up to and finally getting the junior uh, spot, uh, starting spot here this year. Uh, he was at USC. Uh, he had a, a solid 18 through a bunch of picks, but a solid 2018. 2019, uh, you know, was no good, obviously, uh, uh, injuries and problems. And then he goes into Georgia and, um, you know, in 2020, <clears throat> really nice year. Um you know, the Jake Fromm situation before that, obviously, and, and, and they're hoping that he just kind of follows in, in that lineage um, of Georgia QBs, and he's going up against a damn good one in, in his own right in DJ Uyunglele. Uh, I cannot wait to see what uh, defensive packages Georgia, I think, might have. The, th these might be the two best defenses in the country, by the way, and I don't think anything, Brent Venables and his team, I don't think they're, you know, I've heard a lot about, well, he's lost a step. He's lost, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> no, he hasn't. Uh, he's still got it going on. It's a plug-and-play situation. They have NFL talent waiting to start. They just had to have graduation with you know, the guys of the NFL. 
Same thing with Georgia. Georgia's got elite linebackers, corners, and frontline guys across the defense. And their offense should be humming. They got some pretty good running backs, good playmakers. It's all going to come down to JT Daniels. If he performs, if he plays well all year, Georgia can knock on the door for a national championship. If he doesn't play well, they'll fall back. Clemson with DJ Uyunglele, I I think their offense is going to be absolutely positively powerful. I know you lose Trevor Lawrence. I know you lose Travis Etienne. I know you lose a lot of guys on that team, but the flat-out reality is they've got three guys, DJ Uyunglele at quarterback, They've got Will Shipley, a freshman running back out of Weddington, North Carolina, who is ready to just be the next Clemson star back, right? You see Jay Spiller and uh, ATN and all these different players, right? And oh, by the way, it was huge to get Justin Ross back, the junior out of uh, out of uh, Alabama. I mean, this kid is a flat-out baller. He's getting to the point where he's getting compared to the likes of Julio Jones when he was in college. He's getting compared to Sammy Watkins, and he's getting compared to uh, many other Clemson wide receivers, talented players who have come through. Uh, He's getting compared to Justin Jefferson. He's getting compared to uh, some of the best elite wide receivers of the last five to ten years in college football. Getting him back is huge. you got a three-pronged attack, great offensive line. That right there for sure is the game of the week, Clemson, Georgia, in Charlotte, North Carolina, <clears throat> Bank of America Stadium, actually a pretty cool place to go watch a game. Uh, I've seen uh, a couple of Panthers games there. I saw Panthers-Texans. I saw Bills-Panthers. Bills, uh, Bills Panthers. So uh, pretty cool, and I'm sure the college football atmosphere will be uh, as good uh, as well here for week one. I know we, we, we played a few games, right, um, <clears throat> last week, but um, you know this is the real true week one. Um, the schedule's loaded. The games will be great. And then just a quick note here, because I know I have some Central New York fans still kind of following what I'm doing uh, for my radio day. Syracuse is at Ohio, and I've said it a million times. Syracuse needs to win this game, and they need to start out the first four games. um, You know, they need to start the first four games, I I would say, to have a shot at a bowl at at three and one. I I don't think there's any way around it. If they're two and two or worse, it's just going to get ugly. Ohio, Rutgers, Albany, Liberty. Three of those games are at home. There's no excuse to not win three of the first four, although Liberty is really, really, really good. Uh, That game isn't until September 24th, but if you know anything about Liberty, uh, you'll know that uh, they've got uh, a quarterback who is just, and Malik Willis, who's just really, really good from Atlanta. He's a dual kind of guy. I mean, he is just budding, bursting with talent. So Syracuse has, you know, it's hands full. Ohio's a solid team. Um, you know, they should roll Albany, but, you know, who you never know. Uh, but they've got, you know, the ACC is still down. So if you can start 3-1 and one and then somewhere in the next eight games just go 3-5, and five, go to a bowl, I think that would be a win for Syracuse this year. Um, <clears throat> you know, offensive line is eh. The playmakers on defense are gone. Uh, it's going to come down to a, a lot of the offensive line, a lot of the quarterback play. Um, dual threat Garrett Schrader, uh, he's a transfer, played at Mississippi State, and Tommy DeVito, they're going to share quarterback duties to start the season, according to Dino Babers, uh, who announced that uh, this past week, a couple of days ago. So um, I don't like the dual system. I think you got to have a starter, you got to have a backup, and just end it there. But that's what they're going to do. Uh, I don't know if they're going to try to have somebody win a job by the ACC or what, but that shuttle-in, shuttle-out type of a thing, just it, it, it rarely works in the history of college football. Syracuse, though, on their side, they have playmakers coming back. Abdul Adams at running back is back. Jarvian Howard is back, the, You know, opted out from COVID from last year. Sean Tucker, uh, again, going to be a really good player at the Qs, I think. Uh, you got Chris Elmore, a senior running uh, fullback with a lot of experience. And really, the wide receiver core, it's going to come down to a couple of guys. I mean, I think Anthony Queeley for sure and Taj Harris – they got to have big years. Um, you know, but again, if the offensive line doesn't block for Schrader and for DeVito, it won't matter. This old line is so raw, so young, so shaky, so small, and it's going to be very, very difficult for them to, uh, you know, to get it done. So there's some thoughts on week one in college football. I'm Mike Lindsley. We are presented 
by our great friends at Rosie's Corner. If you're in and around Central New York, today as you listen to this is a Fish Friday, so get on down to Rosie's Corner off the Bartell Road exit in Brewerton. They've got fish sandwiches and entrees, mac and cheese, coleslaw, uh, 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 french fries, and of course your pizza wing combinations all Friday and Saturday long for all the games. And don't forget to check in as the weather turns a little bit cooler Their menu will be back, which is Turkey Slop Tuesday, Meatloaf Monday, Wednesday, Chicken and Biscuits. Rosie's Corner is a proud ML Sports Platter sponsor. Make sure you go get them on Facebook and Instagram as well. Rosie's Corner in Brewerton is a proud ML Sports Platter supporter. And by the way, while you're at Rosie's, stop before or after lunch or dinner to Ace Hardware. It's right there on Route 11. They've got it all, man. they got the grills. My man Jeff and his team doing a great job. They've got the grills, they've got your pot soil, they got paint, they've got exterior interior needs. And oh, by the way, they've got local vendors supplying things like barbecue sauce and pickles and you name it. It's a great place, Burton Ace Hardware, right there on Route 11. Hit them both up, Burton Ace Hardware and Rosie's Corner. Proud ML Sports Platter sponsors. And I do want to say a quick, quick hello to the, uh, the Swan and Whitaker families for their support of the ML Sports Platter as well. All right, let's do it. It's Sports Illustrated Buffalo Bills writer Nick Fierro. I uh, talked to Nick uh, on the Bills. Nick Fierro, excuse me. Um, previewing the season, recapping the preseason, uh, chit-chatting a little bit about the uh, about the big time offense being better, the fifty-three man being formed. You name it. Here is this week's crossover episode from the Bills Brawl here on the ML Sports Platter, and we are presented by the Stanley Law Offices and Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse. You're listening to a Brawl Network production. This is a podcast for the best fans in the NFL. Are you in the mafia? Am I in the what? It's time for a Bills Brawl podcast. Second down and seven. Kelly with the tie. Touchdown. Bill Brooks. Allen. Deep shot. And Thurman breaking tackles at the 22, inside the 10, touchdown Buffalo. I'm your host, Mike Lindsley. Thanks for checking in again, Bills Mafia, on another episode of Bills Brawl. You can get us on Twitter at Bills Brawl and me at Mike L Sports as well. We are nearing the regular season. The preseason is over. Three preseason games in the books. The Bills pounded the Packers in the last one, and uh, I can't wait for week one against the Pittsburgh Steelers. There's news across the board with the Bills. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into the games with... uh, our good pal, Nick Firo, he covers the Buffalo Bills, uh, and you can get him on Twitter. Just a fantastic uh, follow, um, and, and he, he really understands and has the pulse of, of the team. That Twitter handle, of course, is at Nick Firo. It's spelled at Nick, F-I-E-R-R-O, a Bills Central publisher for Sports Illustrated. Used to actually be a beat writer for the Eagles for 17 seasons as well. Let's get Nick in here and chat about the preseason, what he saw, the regular season, and Bam Johnson getting traded to the Panthers as well. Nick, welcome aboard. Thank you. Oh, great to, great to be on. What did you take away from the Bills preseason? We have so much to get to, obviously, getting you know gearing up for the, the, the regular season. But you know the three games that you saw in the preseason and, of course, against the Packers, I mean, obviously the offense is just humming. Uh, what were some of your major preseason takeaways? Um, yeah, I'd say that with the first two games, uh, obviously, I, I think that they proved that the uh, they had pretty good backups. Uh, you know, these guys could play. Um, of course, uh, Greg Rousseau was in there as a backup. The first two games looks like he's going to be a starter now. But um, you know, it, on offense, obviously, they didn't play any other offensive linemen except for maybe Cody Ford, and I guess Deion Dawkins got in in that second game because he was coming back from COVID, but. You know they uh, they they rolled out their uh, second team for the most part offensive line um, rotated in some uh, you know receivers who, who were uh, but none of their front line guys you know and and played Mitchell Trubisky and and the other two quarterbacks from and 
Davis Webb, and, and uh, they did pretty well. And, you know, I, I had the same thing for the defense, uh, not playing their, their top guys. And, and then what, by the time they got to their third game, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, I, I don't know how other people feel, but uh, I guess I would call myself old school. I, I feel like you need to get ready for the season by playing football. You can't just, you know, sit all your regulars here. You, at some point, your guys have to get knocked around a little bit and play some real football. And, and so I thought Sean McDermott made the exact right call to, uh, you know, to, to give his starters some work. And it worked out pretty well for them, as we saw on Saturday. Um and I think they got everything they wanted out of it, right? I mean, I think that they, they proved they could play, too. They, they go down the field uh, with that big drive. But they also self-destructed at times, and they needed to go through some of that adversity, too. Uh, pre-snap penalties and things like that. Um, they, they weren't, uh, you know, it, it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. But they need to go through that before they you know, hit the field against the Steelers, who I think really did a good job pr- of preparing themselves in this preseason, too. You know, they, they did play their, their regulars, maybe even more so than Buffalo. So, uh, you know, that could be a tough game. I mean, I, I don't know what the Steelers are going to be like this year, but, you know, last year they, they started out on fire. I think they won their first 11. Okay. The expectation factor, the hype factor, fans back in the building, home and road, Allen's got his contract, all the things that are going into the Buffalo Bills chasing the Chief, the Buffalo Bills, Super Bowl aspirations, all those expectations. Do you think this team can handle that hype and, and those expectations? Yeah, it sure seems like, like they can. It's uh, uh, The guys kind of want to be here. You know, they uh, A lot of guys in the offseason took less money to, to come back. They told their agents, uh, you know, on uncertain terms, you know, I want to be back here. Um, and uh, so I, I think that they, they really uh, – expect to uh to take that next step and but but they all they want to and and uh, sometimes that those things don't always mesh but uh, you know i, I really think and, and just look look at the way that the uh that they played um you know in, the, in these preseason games you can't really tell a lot of times by that especially in this last one because the bills first teamers were going against the green bay second teamers they didn't play their regulars but uh they have uh they they have some um uh on offense, they, they can do a lot of things. I think they proved that part of it. You know, if they want to run the ball, they can. It doesn't look like they are going to, but if they want to, I think they, they'll do a better job than last year. And and I think that the defense, the last year was the first year, I think, under Sean McDermott, where the defense maybe kind of underperformed. Um, but that had a lot to do with, with some things, uh, some injuries, and, and then um, they feel like Star Latule uh, opting out had something to do with that. Probably it did. Uh, but they're, he's back now. They they were kind of shorted up, and they feel like they improved their pass rush, you know, so much so that they were able to trade a guy yesterday, Daryl Johnson. Um, and you know, maybe he's not the last one to go. Uh, I I don't know if they're going to keep six D um, but they have six quality uh, guys there that, uh, that they have to make a decision on. Okay, week one against the Steelers. How crazy is that stadium? Do you think going to be? Yeah, really uh, nuts, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, they haven't had any uh, fans in there since um, 2019 season, and uh, and you know that year was uh, it ended with some doubt. I mean, they they did make the playoffs, but then they they lose uh, in the first. I'm still, by the way, I'm still not over that peel back block. I don't know about you, <laughs> that Cody Ford thing. <laughs> I know. I know they won two playoff games last year, and uh, but you know they should have won that other one, and, and it wasn't Cody Ford's fault. So much so to the, 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 the NFL officiating uh, uh, crew came out with a, with a video halfway through last season, if you remember, talking about how that block was actually considered a, a, a really good one, and they used that as one to illustrate uh, something that's not, a, a, you know, a peel back block. You know, the, the Bills you know, don't have that penalty call. They probably kick the field goal and win the game then. But anyway, yeah, uh, you know, obviously Josh Allen wasn't the quarterback then that he is now. And so now you come back in two years later, two seasons later, and uh, he, he was runner up for MVP. And, um, you know, he, I think he's going to do, I, I wrote this yesterday, I think he's got a really good chance they'd be even better this year because the team around him is better and because they've had the offseason program and um, and because I think the defense might be a little bit better too. What, when does the, the Allen, <clears throat> you know, the anti-Allen 
Alan Haight stop. You know, it, it seems as though he's one of the few quarterbacks in recent times, and certainly as I remember in my lifetime, who gets criticized when he gets pieces around him. You know, it was like the anti-Allen people were there in the beginning, coming out of college, the accuracy problems. He's never going to be anything. He's, you know, they, they traded up to get him. It's He's overrated. This is crazy. Why would you bring him in? Most people wanted a Rosen or, or someone else over him, Lamar, whoever. And, <clears throat> you know, then Allen gets digs. They go set a bunch of records. And the anti-Allen people, the Allen hate comes out still with, well, it was digs. You know, like when does the Allen hate end? Will, w- will it end? I mean, does he have to win a championship? When, when does that stop? Yeah, I don't know. And I'm, I'm not really sure I've, I've been exposed to too much Allen hate. I've just seen a lot of love everywhere. I guess there's always some going to be some people that uh, are just not going to be satisfied or, you know, are going to be looking for something there when, when something is not. But, yeah, you, you got weapons around him. They also made some changes to his, his mechanics and everything. But I mean, look, look at what he can do. I mean, he, he's the total package. He, um, you know, he's making all the throws, and, and he can run. When he takes off and he hits 19 miles an hour, and he's six foot five, two forty, coming at you. That's a tight end with the wide receiver speed. Right. And and now you're if you're a safety or whatever oh. linebacker, you got to make a decision how you want to hit this guy. You know, or do you want to hit this guy? And uh, it's crazy. And of course, he doesn't want to run that much. But when he does, he, I, and look at the throw he made. You know, rolling to his left the other day. Um, uh, not just a, a great throw there. He just loaded it. To Cole Beasley, but Beasley made a great grab too. It was able to protect himself because he knew he was going to be taking a shot right there. Everything was perfectly coordinated right there on that play, and it makes you think like, wow, this, this team could really even be better because they have an up and coming receiver in Gabriel Davis. And I think, you know, I, I'm assuming that Isaiah McKenzie is going to, going to make the team, and he's, he's going to be a better receiver this year. He's just going to be so much better off. I, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I guess there's always going to be a certain amount of people that that. Uh, don't like uh, Josh Allen, and if he stumbles a little bit this year, or maybe doesn't have the kind of season that he had last year, they're going to say, "See." But uh, I don't, I don't care. Uh, I think that uh, you did that once; you can do it again, and I think he will. I tell you what, it, it, and those people just don't pay attention to football because there's not a Hall of Fame quarterback out there ever who didn't have crazy help. Aikman had Irvin and Emmett Smith and Jane Ovechek and probably the best offensive line ever. Montana had Rice, you know, like Bradshaw had Sw- Swan and Stallworth uh, and Franco Harris, and he had the Steel Curtain defense. Jim Kelly had Andre Reed and Thurman Thomas. Like every Hall of Fame quarterback in the history of football, they have weapons. So Josh Allen, to me, it should be no different. I think he's really taken uh, a-, a major step, you know, with pocket control. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but it just seems to me, you know, even just before Diggs got there and and then when the offense started to explode, his pocket presence and control and that decision of, hey, I'm going to give that extra check down. I I know when I'm going to bail now, you know, on the pocket. I I, I know a little bit more about what I'm doing in terms of being in this pocket and controlling that. Do you do you sense that now that he's just an A plus pro in that department? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. He's not as prone to take off uh, down the field, and which is what they, you know, they want him to stay in that pocket. And we saw it a little bit in the game on Saturday. You know, he stayed in there, took some shots. Um, he, he stood pretty tall under pressure, and um, you know, and that, that uh, and he did that. Whereas, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, he might have, uh, you know, he might have been out of the pocket there. And you know, you're, I don't care how big you are, how strong you are. You know, you're, you're exposing yourself to injury when you're doing something like that. He had the concussion, I guess it was two seasons ago, um, or maybe it was three years ago. I, I, but I, I don't know. But you know, you don't want that happening. And, and uh, um, you know, he's he's a uh, yeah. He, he's really. I think he's just. He's got everything going for him now. I, I don't. Is there a weakness in this game? I I'm not really seeing it. You know, uh, I, I really not. I I, I don't know. Uh, let the let the uh, let the haters uh, ring in, but I I'm not really seeing anything there now. I, I think he's a really good you know pocket quarterback, and when he has to, he's he's just maybe the best. He has a chance to be the best ever running quarterback when you factor in everything. Okay, um, with with the cuts and and the trade of of Daryl Johnson, 
Uh, did it, has anything surprised you here as we inch closer as we record this to the 53 man? Yeah, nothing really. I mean, I, you know, I, with, um, Brandon Bean was saying on Saturday during the game that they were getting calls. So, you know, I, it, it wasn't surprising that they ended up trading one of these guys away. I thought maybe it was going to end up being, you know, uh, Mario Addison, but you know, Mario Addison is what, 34 years old. Um, but, uh, you know, Daryl Johnson became expendable because they they got Epi Obata, uh, ironically, from the Panthers. Uh, and then, you know, they drafted two guys that, that are looking really good. So, and um, uh, Boogie Basham. Uh, and so, you know, uh, nothing. I guess, I guess maybe the, the wide receivers, like, uh, uh, you know, I thought maybe it, it, they're going to have they're going to have some tough. Um, you know, calls a wide receiver too. There's no, no question about Brandon Powell. You know, he was an early cut. I thought maybe they'd hold on to him a little bit longer, but really, I didn't have him projected in my final 53 anyway. So, and sometimes when they they let guys like that go, like a Brandon Powell go early, they're doing him a favor. They they do it that way on purpose, so he has a chance to catch all of us teams before all this stuff happens. Do you think this regime, Nick, with Bean and McDermott? And Allen and Diggs and some of the guys who will be together for a few years. Do, do you think they win a championship? Um, yeah, I think they finally get over the hump. Um, you, you know, they uh, they seem like they have a, a really good culture in here. And you know, when you just look at the roster and stuff, I think it compares pretty favorably to what the Bills had. You know, when they were going to four straight Super Bowls, um, they might not have you know the Hall of Fame pass rusher not yet anyway, but. Uh, you know, and people are starting to compare uh, Risto with, with uh, I, I, I don't know. I, they, they, uh, they have a quarterback now. You know, I think the quarterback is everybody's been as good as Jim Kelly. And, uh, and Risto might be every bit as good as, as uh, Bruce Smith. I don't know, down the road. But, uh, and they don't have a Hall of Fame running back either. But they have play, players. Uh, they, they're, they're pretty well distributed here. And, um and they have a uh, they have a pretty good culture, and they have uh, they have weapons. They can throw the ball, they can play today's game, um, and um, yeah, they uh, uh, and they the schedule this year is not too terribly cra- crazy when you look at it on paper. It might turn out to be different, but you know, you're sticking, they they can end up winning 12, 13 games uh, in this one and and getting home field. But I I don't know that they necessarily need home field to to even win to, to go all the way. I know that was a big deal last year, and they still haven't won a road playoff game in God knows when, but, um, you know, they should have beaten Houston, as we talked about a little earlier. Um, and, and I think that if this team had to go on a road, they, they could do something. They, uh, they just they were kind of flat against Kansas City last year, no question about it. But um, but I, I don't, you know, this is a different team, and I, I think that the team's still on the rise. Tell you what, I, I think that, uh, and we're talking some Bills football with the Bills Central publisher for Sports Illustrated. That's Nick Firo. Get him on Twitter at Nick Firo, spelled F I E R R O. The schedule, I'm with you. I, I think it's terrific, actually. I mean, you start out, you know, right out of the shoot, home one o'clock, boom, love it. Then you got a one o'clocker at Miami, still on the East Coast. You got another one o'clocker at home. And then you got another one o'clocker at home. And you got three of the first four at home. You can get out of the gate there, maybe three and one, four and oh. Uh, then you got the biggie at Kansas City, and then you know you get into the primetime deals with that one, and then the Monday nighter against Tennessee. You get the bye in week seven, but then you get right back to it again. One o'clock, one o'clock, one o'clock, one o'clock, and and then back to some some prime time with, with with the Saints and Pats and and so on and so forth. I, I think it's a pretty darn good blend. I think you have recovery periods here, Nick. You know where uh, uh, you can get back from the prime time, and, and I think you know you one thing the Bills don't have to deal with this year. They don't face somebody coming off of a bye. So, you know, somebody playing, uh, preparing for two weeks for the Bills, they don't face that all year. So I, I like the schedule. I do. Yeah. And I think some of these games are going to be changed to prime time as we go. As yeah, we go probably. Along. Yeah. Going, going into the flex scheduling and everything. So, But, again, it's the Bills. It's such a small market that even though they're, they're really good, that, uh, you know, maybe TV doesn't, just, just doesn't seem to like the Bills that much because it just doesn't get the audience. But, you know, I still think that they're going to end up with more prime time games than are on the schedule right now, for sure. <clears throat> so, yeah, but yeah, it, it is it is good. I mean, they they have uh, they have uh, a, a lot of games here, and they have it set up so that 
that they're not, uh, you know, they don't have anything crazy going on. Like you said, they they don't have to turn around and, and do, do do these weird things. And um, you know, last two games at home too. Um, uh, yep. That kind of mean three out of the last four at home. So um, you know, I, we're talking about you know guys, teams, you know, the, the Panthers, you know, the Falcons and the Jets. You know, so if they do kind of stumble. I think they can kind of get well uh, in at least three of those last four games. I would watch out for the Patriots this year. I can't imagine the Patriots are going to be down a second straight year, but we'll see. Yeah, no that's doubt. Be their primary competition, and, you know, and, and Dolphins too. Yeah, no doubt. I was just going to end with that. Actually, throw throw me a little bit more there. Uh, throw you the line back out on on the Pats, Dolphins, and Jets. Kind of the season outlook for the division. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I think you know. I, Look, we saw what happened with the Patriots last year. They didn't have their quarterback, and, and look what happened. And, uh, they plugged Cam Newton in there. It didn't work out. He might be the starter this year. He might not. I don't know. But they squeezed out. Didn't they win seven games last year? <laughs> how did that happen? I know. I, I don't know how they squeezed out seven wins with that. They Half the team opted out. That 20 guys opted out of last year. <laughs> it's just crazy um, how they squeezed out that, that many wins. And then now they uh, – They've uh, gone crazy in, in free agency because they haven't been drafted very well, frankly, uh, over the years. So they've tried to correct some problems with money, uh, and maybe they have. And uh, I think that they're going to be better at quarterback one way or another. You know, either Cam Newton is going to be a better quarterback or this kid that they drafted is going to be the real deal because now uh, Belichick's not even committing uh, to the guy. So I don't know. Uh, I, I still I see the the uh, – uh, the Patriots is being a double-digit win team. I really do. And maybe the Dolphins are, too. I, it just depends on Tua and, you know, where his head is. And, you know, they're apparently, you know, gung-ho. They're still gung-ho on uh, trying to make the trade for Deshaun Watson. So, you know, what's going on there? Uh, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, and the Jets are the Jets. And they, they, had, they still have a ways to go. They're a year away from being a year away. I think that they're compiling some talent on that team. And, they're in the right direction with the with the quarterback, and um, but you know I, I I don't see any way that they don't, they don't finish fourth in this division. Bills Central Publisher for Sports Illustrated, Nick Firo. Get him on Twitter. A must follow at Nick Firo. That's at Nick F I E R R O. The Buffalo Bills writer and insider for Sports Illustrated. Nick, thanks for the time. Enjoy the season, my man. We'll do this again. Okay, my pleasure.